السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد و نسل علی رسول الکریم اما بعد رب شحل صدری و یسیر لی امری وحل الغدت من لسانی یفقہ قولی All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe, and peace and blessing of Allah be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and all those who follow him till the day of judgment. Amin thumma amin. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give us tawfiq to speak the truth in the light of the Quran and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, to understand them, to accept them in the hearts and to apply them in our life. Amin thum amin. Also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give us sincere iman, sound health and everlasting halal wealth. As you know that, that this is our live show which is every Saturday between 7 and 8 o'clock UK timing and this show is all about asking Islamic questions in Urdu, English and Arabic and all those brothers and sisters who have the contact and who have the link, please forward this link to others so that they can also join us and if they want to ask any question because now we are in the month of Shaban and nearly month is left to start the Ramadan, so alhamdulillah there will be so many other questions where you will be, you know, or you or your friend or your family members might be, you know, struggling to get the answer. So these are the great opportunities, mashallah. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Also, let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, that soon, inshallah, we will be starting with a new series about the reminders of, uh, great reminders in the month of Ramadan. And please keep on watching and following the channel, inshallah. You will get lots of, lots of, mashallah, uh, new videos coming up. And the, so far what we have done is we have put all the 28 letters uh, of Arabic alphabets and we have explained to the, uh, in that, that how you can use each letter with different nine vowels of Arabic language. So that 28 videos are already uploaded, mashallah. Anybody can study, young and adult, Muslim as well as non-Muslim. It's very simple and in a very nice and easy way it has been explained. And the second series uh, or the set of videos that I have uploaded is all about reading the Quran in six lessons, which means you can start reading from Alif Bata and you follow each lesson properly, then inshallah within six lessons you can start reading the Quran. And that you can read Quran in six lessons. Six lessons can be divided into, uh, you know, the let it, uh, six hours, six days, or six weeks, or six months. Alhamdulillah. Yes, uh, what is recommended ibadah in Shaban? Shaban is not different than the other months. Shaban is not different than other months. All that normally we are doing in other months, we have to do the same thing in this month. But there are certain important things that, that has to do uh, or has to put into consideration in the month of Shaban. And that is that before you start into Ramadan, Anything that you have, you like any fast that you have missed of the previous Ramadan, then you should make them up in this month. That's the first thing and the first priority. And also, you should start actually, uh, at least, you know, fasting Mondays of this month and Thursdays of this month, alhamdulillah. And when it comes to the 15th of Shaban, don't single out 15th of Shaban for any ibadah, which inshallah I will be dealing in my Juma Khutbah in details about this issue, that uh, 15th of Shaban, there are people, they have spoken about the merits and virtues of that particular night, and they, the next day they want to fast and they want to pray the same night with the Hajjut and other things. And they single out these ibadat, this kind of worship in the, on 15th of Shaban. That is wrong. 
with regards to the fasting of Shaban, yes, you can fast 15th of Shaban, you can fast 13th of Shaban, 14th of Shaban, and 15th of Shaban. So these are the three days, and you will get the reward of fasting the whole month of Shaban. So you, you don't have to single out one night, particularly of 15th of Shaban. Also, you might be seeing in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and in some of the Arab worlds that Muslims get together in the graveyards in this particular night. But this is not from the teaching of Rasulullah or teaching of the Sahaba or our great Imams. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. What is your opinion on those who are against following the four madhahib? <coughs> who are against following the four madhahib in regards to fiqh rulings? And what uh, would rather take their rulings directly from the text? See, Alhamdulillah, there is no ruling as such. As long as these people who are following directly Quran and Hadith, and they respect the opinions and the uh, explanations given by our four Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam, Imam Malik, and Imam al-Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahumullah, then there is no harm in that. But if these people who are following directly Quran and Hadith, and then they reject or they insult the opinions of the Imams, and they like you know uh, belittle them then this is haram this is haram because uh, insulting of any muslim is you know uh, not permissible in our religion like somebody would say you know i don't accept your imam because your imam was jahil and your imam didn't, didn't even know the hadith, hadith properly and, and your imam like, like some, some of the people, people i have heard them saying about some of the great scholars they say oh your imam is you know he doesn't know the hadith and people they consider him they, him weak in hadith daif al hadith and so we don't take his opinion but this is wrong to say for a person ordinary person of today talking about those great imams all we can say is my brother this is uh, the opinion of the imam when the, it doesn't give any uh, direct ayat or hadith. So I'm following the Quran and hadith based on uh, this imam or this sheikh or this uh, direct understanding. But in generally, I'm saying that those people who are insulting imams or those people who are insulting the people who are following the madhahib, I don't agree with that because there's no point in doing that. Those people who are following madhahib, they may not have the ability to understand the Quran and Hadith directly by themselves. They may not even be able to understand. Even if you give them the Hadith, they might say that this Hadith could be with our own Imam and how can this Imam be different than this. So it, it will lead to a big argument. So I don't agree with those people who talk against those people who are following the Madhahib. I, I don't follow any Madhahib. I don't follow Abu Hanifa's madhab or Imam Malik's madhab or Imam Shafi's madhab or Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. My madhab is Islam and I follow only Quran and Hadith. But at the same time, there are ahadith which are very well explained by these four Imams. So I take the one that is, mashallah, the best explanation given by any of them. Alhamdulillah. Uh, how to recommend a young man whose life rotates about haram acts? Pray for him. Pray for him and be good to him, be nice to him, don't look down upon him, don't hate him, don't, uh, you know, d take distance from him and l r find the reason why this person is in the haram and try to change his environment, try to change all his, uh, whatever the problem that he has got. And inshallah, Allah will change him though they have no prerequisite knowledge. Yes, if they don't have the prerequisite knowledge of uh, the madhabs, and they, there are people like that. But at the same time, those people who are arguing, who are following the madhab, do they have the knowledge? They are all the same. I, I know that when I was working as an imam in Dubai, 
this ordinary people walking in the street who doesn't know Arabic, doesn't know Hadith, who doesn't know even the name of his own Imam and doesn't know the direct fiqh of that particular Imam just because he is his uh, Indian Imam or Pakistani Imam of his Masjid or Bengali Imam of his Masjid has said something to him and he got the you know reply from that Imam. So, he thinks that this is the opinion of uh, you know Imam Abu Hanifa and he tries to prove that he is more knowledgeable than the uh, you know the Imam that he is talking to and then he will try to show off. So, definitely the other Imam who is a learned man and who knows about the different opinions he will insult him further. So, that is that is the first thing when you, when you are saying that these people they do not have the prerequisite knowledge of the uh, that particular madhab or something like that. So, even those people who are arguing about the madhab and supporting their madhab they themselves may not know. The, if they really know what Abu Hanifa has said in his original book in his original fatwa and if they know that what Abu Hanifa has you know the dalil for that then we can say okay okay this man is really talking about this particular imam and this man has got the dalil about imam what is shab e qadar or shab e miraj uh, shab e qadar and shab e miraj uh, they are two different nights shab e qadar is night of the qadar and shab e miraj is the night where rasul uh, had gone for the journey from mecca to jerusalem and from jerusalem to seven heavens that is called Mi'raj and shab e qadar is mentioned inna anzallahu fi laylatul qadr wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadr this is the uh, five odd nights of the last 10 days of Ramadan this shab e qadr is not the 15th of Shaban whoever says that it is mistaken and I, I don't mind saying that if people they don't accept it that's fine but shab e qadr is not the 15th of Shaban the shab e qadr is shab, -e, shab is uh, Persian letter word which means night, rat and qadr means uh, powerful, taqat or qudrat wali which means a, uh, a great night. So, this shab e qadr is the five uh, odd nights, five odd nights of the last 10 days of Ramadan, 21st of Ramadan. 23rd of Ramadan, 25th of Ramadan and 27th and 29th. These are the five nights. One of them will be the shab e qadr and Mi'raj is the night which is in the month of Rajab where Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi has uh, traveled from Mecca to uh, Jerusalem in one night and there in the same night he traveled from Jerusalem to seven heaven. That is called Mi'raj and uh, night, Shabe means night. So, night of Mi'raj. What are the elements to consider in terms of Nasiha to give to somebody in a detention center? See, I do not know what are the rules and regulations in detention, detention center. Uh, you have to abide by the law. You cannot talk something personal to somebody. You cannot talk something about, you know, which can go against you by the law. All this discipline has to be maintained and generally you can, you know, talk about any good thing that you know the case of the person. So, that is my advice that when you are, uh, what are the elements of, uh, to consider in terms of nasiha to give to somebody in detention center. See, th this is what I am saying that first of all you have to know the situation of the person and alhamdulillah if you know the situation of the person then based on that uh, within the limit of the do's and don'ts and allowed and not allowed the rules and regulations you can advise that person inshallah so uh, yusuf i think i have answered almost all your questions and please forward this to all your links all those brothers who are listening to this program this is a live program and you can put your questions uh, either following the number given on the uh, screen, you can call or you can text the message or either you can text on the top chat box uh, just uh, on my left side, you can uh, you know uh, write your question as these brothers are writing. So, this is the first thing that you have to do my brothers and sisters. Second thing, if you have the links, if you have the access to your contacts, 
then do do forward it to others alhamdulillah i will be here up until 8 o'clock so you can inshallah uh, we still have nearly 35 minutes to end the show so alhamdulillah i can still help you with this so uh, with the question answers jazakallah khairan uh, for all your questions barakallah fikum bismillah My question is, if you contributed money to your department on birthday gift for a colleague and if the department bought alcohol as a present for them, is my money went into, into a haram cause? Yes, definitely it is for haram cause because first of all, you when you bought the gift for the birthday party for someone, definitely it seems to be a non-Muslim. If, if you have contributed, definitely that person might be a non-Muslim <coughs> because uh, uh, buying alcohol from the g gifted money for somebody's birthday contribution, then it has to be, I, uh, I know that even Muslims when they celebrate their birthdays, they normally they do not buy alcohol or they do not serve in the parties alcohol unless they are hypocrites type of munafiqeen Muslims or they just, they do not know what Islam says about halal and haram. So, but as far as if the department has bought the alcohol, still, still, because I think uh, if you were not aware of what they were, be, they're going to buy for that person, at least like the common sense says that when you are contributing uh, money for a non-Muslim's birthday, then you can't restrict him or her to buy anything halal for you. So, definitely this was a risk for contributing that money. You could have given some excuses just to, you know, avoid that. But next time if you do it, be careful, you should not contribute for that. Many girls wear hijab and tight jeans, trou tight jean trousers. What is Islamic ruling? Nothing. These people, they don't know what is hijab and they don't know what is the etiquette of wearing the uh, dresses. So, uh, in Islam, uh, the dress code is there mentioned in, in Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Ya Bani Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuari sawatikum wa risha wa libasu taqwa dhalika khair. O children of Adam, indeed we have revealed the garments for you, which uh, is the purpose for that is that it covers your private part and also it uh, adds to your beauty. So, if people are wearing tight jeans, whether man or woman, and the body is fully exposing everything that is there, it's like, you know, uh, just changing the color of the skin. A person is a man or a woman, if a person is naked, and it's just changed the color of the skin, like the jeans color, it is the same as you wear the jean, tight jeans, covering, t touching your skin, or you just remove the skin, uh, uh, trouser and color your skin with the trousers, this is same. So, it is according to Islam, it is totally haram in Islam to wear the tight jeans, especially for the women and for the men as well if they it, uh, uh, expose their, you know, full body. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I am reading the text which has been sent by someone on the, uh, f the number, mobile number. Do you, uh, when do you pray Salatul Ishraq and uh, Salatul Duha? What is the differences? and its reward and how many rakat uh, do you okay the, there is there is no difference in that uh, it's a difference of the name after after you have uh, you know prayed your fajr prayer and the sun has risen high and it is the land starts getting the heat on the uh, surface of the land that is the time for praying your duha or say shraq and it is uh, extended up until the time when the uh, sun comes to the zenith, like in the middle of the uh, head, on the top of the head. Till that, the minimum is two rakat and the maximum is ten rakat, uh, eight rakat. Alhamdulillah, and reward is, alhamdulillah, whatever the normal reward is for the sunnah. There is no specific uh, ruling on uh, mentioning of Rasul about that. Okay, but alhamdulillah, it is rewarded, it is something very beneficial, 
the more you pray in field prayers and uh, these are all uh, voluntary uh, acts of salah you definitely will get the reward of the like praying the, sun uh, the sunnas uh, assalamu alaikum can a woman propose to men for a hand in marriage it should be done through the mediators not directly one to one and if they, these things are done uh, i think it is uh, it has created a problem the, uh, the in islam the hikmah is that it should be arranged you know through the people but if somebody does not have then still i will advise that don't contact a woman should not directly contact a man first of all it's a risk then and second thing in sooner or later in future the man will disrespect the woman because he will say you came to me i didn't come to you and there are many cases as such but islamically it is not like that a woman came to rasul sallam and she offered herself for marriage to rasul sallam so the scholars are saying it is permissible because rasul sallam did not uh, tell a woman uh, don't do that or you can't you know so only the scholars who are saying this they say that she didn't have any uh, mahar uh, mahram she didn't have any relative she was uh, like single woman and she was not offering herself to any ordinary man she came directly to prophet sallam and it was not one to one in a privacy it was in a gathering of the sahaba as well that's the reason they say that one of the sahabi after she was insisting many times rasul sallam did not say yes then he said ya rasulullah if you are not in need of marriage with this woman then i can do that and then the matter went on like that so it is in that sense uh, at least somebody was there and it's not private it was not like in uh, in a that way because today people when they are women especially women they are making the decision and they don't bring their mahram in front of them and they don't trust their mahram for that and then they go on their own then may, many a time if it is even if the marriage may not break but it not be peaceful marriage and successful marriage okay is three talaq uh, given in one go valid as a complete talaq or regarded as one talaq according to a hanafi madhab yes it is considered as three talaq but according to my research and my studies with the respect of the imams alhamdulillah it is one talaq uh, what is best tafsir of the quran the best tafsir of the quran is the you read the quran first let me explain to you your tafsir is the best tafsir how is that that first of all you read the quran in arabic properly then you read the translation of the quran as many times as you can till you understand the verse properly then you take the explanation from tafsir ibn kathir or any english translation available where they have the commentary given at the bottom and there is a best tafsir for the beginners is tafsir al jalalain mashallah it's simple and it is also simple in english translation though the tafsir al jalalain is in arabic but uh, it is translated in urdu and english as well so that will give you a brief you know uh, understanding of why this uh, ayah was revealed and the fourth is that you should know from that what message you receive from it and the fifth is you have to apply it in your life so that's the best tafsir of the quran there are people who read the tafsir of the quran just to understand it they don't want to practice it just to prepare for the lectures they want to just deliver it and they don't apply in their life so this is not tafsir the best tafsir of the quran is as i said general understanding tafsir ibn kathir is good tafsir and that is in english translated version i'm saying there are many good tafsirs in arabic mashallah but so far what is available in english translation is tafsir ibn kathir and there are many good tafsir available even the tafsir of abul ala mudidi rahmatullah alay Uh, is also uh, tafhim al quran translated in english and also it is originally in urdu and there are many other tafasir but first of all you have to know the arabic and its translation and then you can go for the tafsir if someone believes in a fabricated hadith or weak hadith how to convince them first of all you should have the knowledge of that why it is fabricated and why it is weak 
if you are just saying it that uh, this hadith is weak, he can put the question on you. How do you know that? So, this is a good knowledge and it's a good, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, great, uh, like, you know, branch of uh, science where you have to know the when hadith becomes fabricated because hadith is hadith of Rasul How can we say that Rasul is lying? How can we say that he said something which is weak? So, it is not he who said weak, it is, it is who are those, the, the weak people are those or fabricators are those who narrate or in his name or ascribe to his name and they may be liars or they may be weak. So, we have to know all those things before we convince anybody that this is a weak hadith. You have to collect all the information about that particular hadith, why this hadith is weak and who has made it weak. So, and then you can say that to the brother that this is weak. Uh, Faiz bhai, assalamu alaikum. Is it halal uh, to get a phone on contract? Yes, it is halal and it is not riba, inshallah. Uh, some countries have uh, the ratio of women to men 6 to 1. How to resolve this in marriage? See, the best way is that, uh, you know, they look for the marriage. This could be a reason. I will not encourage second marriages because uh, I don't know why people might be saying why Sheikh Abdul Majid is saying that it is the Sunnah and all that. And Quran says, Mathna wa Thulatha wa Ruba'a. So, I, I can say that Quran says that, but Quran also says how to deal with them. Quran also says that what is the right of the first wife, what is the right of the second wife, how you should be dealing with the first wife sexually, how you should be dealing with the second wife sexually, how you should be dealing with the first wife with her social needs, how you should be dealing with the second, third and fourth wife, uh, you know, in their social needs and how sincere and honest you should be with both of them. You might be lying to one, you might be hiding things from one and you make an excuse that I don't have to say this and that to the first one or the second one. All these are complications, so definitely people can't argue with me on this. I have I'm been dealing all these kind of things for a long time, mashallah. So, I'm not talking about the second marriage is not the solution for this kind of ratio because second marriage of this kind of ratio can go more. Instead of six, six to one, it can be 12 to one. Why? Because this uh, uh, double marriage and uh, t t three wives and four wives, uh, the most of them are not successful and they are not in peaceful. Okay. So, the second solution I can say is that look for the rishtas and marriages from outside the families, outside uh, the different cultures and different races. Like if suppose if a people are, you know, uh, white people marrying the black people should be common and vice versa, black woman, white man, black man, white woman and Pakistani, Indian, Muslim, Bengali, this and that. So that because most of these ratios could be because that they are not marrying in outside their, you know, terms and conditions, outside their framework, outside their, you know, uh, pick and choose terms and conditions. So, that could be the best solution and we can see that example of Rasulullah when he came to Medina, mashallah, he helped the Sahaba who came from Makkah to Medina, who migrated from different places. He got them married to the women of Medina and men and women from Medina were married to the men and women from Makkah. So, and they were from different tribes, even from like, you know, Jews and the Christian women were married to Muslim men. So, these are the ways to resolve that ratio. as Alaikum, Doctor, is it Maghrib time soon? Uh, yeah, definitely Maghrib time is soon, but uh, you can pray when you, uh, you know, listen to the Adhan and go for it, inshallah. Uh, Samir, is, is poetry halal to listen to? See, poetry, as I said that if you are addicted to the poetry, then it is not halal. Because even the poets, poets who are, you know, nasheed artists and all that, I, I know them. Even in the Salah, they might be making lots of mistakes in reading the Quran and they might add up with this kind of things. And this could like, you know, ring into their brains even while they are in the Sajda, while in, they are in the Salah. So, uh, if that is the case with those who are Nasheed artists and poets, so if you are 
too much into it, then I can say that uh, uh, it will, you know, uh, the main purpose, my brother, all these brothers and sisters, you might think I am very extreme in this, but no, this is the reality. If you do not know the Quran, then definitely listening to the poetry for you is haram. If you do not know the Quran and you have not studied the Quran, you have not understood the Quran, then do not listen to the music, do not listen to the poetry, do not listen to the songs or nasheeds. Even those Nasheed artists who are listening to me, Alhamdulillah, I am honest to you, my brothers and sisters, you may be a very great famous person and you may be, you know, a student of great scholars and this and that. But if you as a Nasheed artist, famous Nasheed artist, and you have got millions of followers, but if you don't know what Quran says, if you don't know what Hadith says, if you don't know your religion, then what you are doing is also haram. So be careful. I have done my job, it's up to you because for me the first priority is Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said to Prophet Muhammad, sallam, read in the name of Allah, your Lord who created you. Who created. Second thing, Afala Yatadabbarun al Quranam ala kulubin akfaluha. Allah says that why don't they understand they read the Quran and ponder upon the Quran? It seems their hearts are locked. The second thing is you have to understand the Quran. The third thing is that uh, those who then if they should read it, it should as it should be read and if uh, they are the true believers and if they do not do it, then they are the losers. They are the losers, they are not the true believers of this book. So these are the three things, first you have to read, then understand, then accept it in your heart by, you know, applying and accepting no, uh, um, uh, like, you know, showing off or no, uh, like hypocrisy in your heart. So this is the third thing. And fourth is, ittabi' ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Allah says in the Quran uh, to, the, uh, to the Prophet and to the Muslims as well, ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum. That follow what is revealed to you by your Lord. So it is the command given to us. So first we have to read, understand, accept it and follow it. Wa balligh ma unzila ilayk. And whatever is revealed to you, O Muhammad, the fifth duty is that you have to convey this message to the people. This is Quran I'm talking about. These are the five duties that we owe to Quran, that we have to read the Quran, we have to understand the Quran, we have to accept it in our heart and we have to apply it in our life and then we have to convey it. And then, alhamdulillah, if we have done this and we do these five duties till our last breath, then we are the true believers of this Quran. Otherwise, we will fall into the problem on the Day of Judgment where Rasul will be standing on the Day of Judgment in, in, in the front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will say, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّا قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُرًا O oh Allah, O oh my Lord, this is my Ummah who has thrown this Quran behind their back. What was the reason? Could be they were Nasheed artists, but they were not learners of the Quran. They were not students of the Quran. They may be poet, poets and mashallah writers, but they were not the students of the Quran. They were not reading, they were not learning, they were not understanding, they were not applying, they were not preaching. So this, these are the many reasons could be there, but this, these are the main things. So your question, it is a big answer, lengthy answer, but in short, if you don't know the Quran, then don't listen to the Nasheed because it is haram. And all those Nasheed artists, if they don't know anything about the true religion, if they don't study their religion, the way I said, the six duties that they owe to Quran, if they don't do that, then even for them to produce a Nasheed and this kind of poetry is also haram. Is it allowed to pray for Salah in a public transport? Uh, I will advise you, my brothers and sisters, delay, it doesn't matter. But don't pray in public transport. Don't pray because this is not actually guided properly by Rasul Rasulullah did pray on the camel. 
but how that prayer was done, what were the terms and conditions, they are not described in details. People have lots of explanations given to them, but my brothers and sisters, the, why you people are putting yourself into trouble? If it is a matter of Zohar and Asar, then wait till the Asar comes. Or you pray your, if you get the chance to pray your Zohar properly, then combine Asar with that. And if you have a time that you can't pray Zohar on time, and you might pray, get the time to pray Asar, then combine your Zohar with Asar and pray properly. Why you people are, subhanAllah, having this kind of a problem? Don't trouble yourself. Islam is easy. Same case with the Maghrib and Isha, that if you get the chance to pray Maghrib properly, then pray Maghrib properly and combine Isha with it. Doesn't matter, Allah will accept it. And if you have, you know, you don't get the time to pray Maghrib on time and you might get the proper time to pray Isha, then join your Maghrib and Isha at the time of Isha, alhamdulillah. Islam is that easy. Why to complicate yourself? You know, in public transport, you do this. You might, and then especially at this situation, you might be attacked by somebody who hates Islam. And then it is again a big, big risk. Why to take that problem for yourself? Can you shed some light on the issue of moon sighting? Uh, can we uh, in UK follow the sighting of Saudi or we go with UK sighting? Jazakallahu khairan. See, I will tell you go by UK sighting because you, your sighting will be of your own land. So this is my uh, advice to all brothers and sisters. Go by the sighting of and especially go by the sighting of your own town your own town, inshallah. So if your town, mashallah, they are Muslims, they will not, you know, do something haram that can, you know, destroy the whole ibadah of the month of Ramadan. So go by the, you know, sighting of your town people and the one who is authorized to, you know, announce that he will bear the consequences of the sin if he is misguiding, but you don't separate yourself from the community. Go by that and maintain the unity. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Every day I try to wake up for Fajr. I even set an alarm, but the problem is when I get up, I see it ring and then I fall back asleep. Uh, can you give some advice? Try, keep on trying, inshallah, and once you are trying, inshallah, Allah will be, you know, there to help you, inshallah. It happens to many people. It happens to many people unless somebody is really an imam of the masjid and he is worried about his job and the community that he will not get the salary or he will be fired from the job, then definitely uh, that person. But otherwise, if you are an ordinary person and you are, mashallah, a woman, you don't have that obligation, but still you have the concern. Try, inshallah, work out, set up your time before going to bed, what time you sleep, how you, you know, with what precautions you should maintain the good etiquette before going to bed. And inshallah, pray to Allah and make dua to Allah that Allah will help you and you will have, inshallah, energy to get up for the prayer, inshallah, for Fajr. How can Muslims love our Prophet Muhammad rather than just say, we love him and no actions. My brother Mohan 999, you should have asked that how could we really love Allah first? Because Prophet Muhammad came to tell us about Allah. So if we love Allah, we love Prophet Muhammad And why I'm saying is this, because one of the uh, conditions of our La ilaha illallah is the love for Allah. And the answer is there in the Quran. Answer is there because that's the reason I'm saying that when you talk about Prophet Muhammad, the love will come together. How is that? Quran says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّنَ اللَّهِ قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّنَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ See, this is the ayah where Allah SWT is saying, O oh, Prophet Muhammad SAW, tell these people. They talk about that how Allah will love them and how they love Allah. So, loving Allah or getting Allah, receiving Allah's love 
you want Allah to love you, the criteria is to follow Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And Rasul Sallallahu has said, لا يؤمن, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. This is very clear, the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Kitab al-Iman and Kitab al-Ilm. The Rasul Sallallahu has said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. Uh, first the ayah about love of Allah and the second hadith of the love, excuse me, <coughs> the love for Rasulullah sallallahu The ayah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّنَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ Say, if you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then follow Muhammad sallallahu follow me, and definitely then Allah will love you. This is, Allah, you, your claim that you love Allah and your, your wish to that for Allah to love you, the criteria is that you follow Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in your life. Do as what he, he has, what the way he has asked us to do. Live by his guidance. Second thing, that your love, which is your question here, that your love for Rasul Sallallahu is very clear in the hadith. That, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده ووالده والناس أجمعين. That a person cannot be a true believer unless he loves me more than his father, more than his son, and every man around him. And what that love means, that love of Rasul Sallallahu more than the father, more than the son, more than, you know, people around that, that is mentioned in Surah Tawbah, that is described more. قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ اِغْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ and your children, and your grandchildren, and then your wives, and your brothers and sisters, and your other relatives, and you love your وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَأَمْوَالٌ اِقْتَرَفْتُمُهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِ That these eight, cheese, eight, eight things, love for your Parents and ancestors, love for your wives, your brothers and sisters, and your uh, other relatives. And then your wealth, and your business, and your dwellings. Eight things. If these are more beloved to you than Allah and His Rasul and fighting in His cause, then wait for Allah's decision. Allah will not guide the rebellions. So these are very clear. What does that mean? It means that when it comes to the relationship with your parents, the relationship with your other relatives, human relationship, you cannot compromise with deen. You cannot. You have to uh, love and respect all these human relationships according to the guidance of Allah and His Rasul. Not you, uh, you can't just disobey Allah and His Rasul for your mother. You can't disobey Allah and His Rasul for your dunya. You can't, uh, if you do that, then you are amongst the fasiqeen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not guide you to the right path. So, in short, what I want to say is that people, those who are saying that they love Allah and they love Rasul and their life is totally opposite of that, that means they are hypocrites, subhanallah. They, are, they don't have any respect of Islam in their hearts. You know, our life is first, when we say Muslim, we are servants of Allah, we are slaves of Allah. And we are those who have to abide by Allah's law. Our everything that we do in our life, whether it is a job, whether it is your personal activities, whether it is your relationship with your husband or wife, whether it is your relationship with your brothers and sisters, whether your relationship in any aspect of your life, 
it has to be according to the teaching of Islam. That's the true Islam. That's the true Muslim. If you don't have that and you are just normal, you don't know how to relieve yourself in the toilet. You don't know what cleanliness means. You don't know what salah means. You don't know what zakah means. You don't know what halal uh, eating is uh, meant. And you don't know what halal earning is meant. And you don't know what, what are the limits for mixing men and women together. You don't have the limit, you know, uh, understanding of mahrim and non mahrim. And you just chat with anybody the way you like it. Subhanallah, all these things, and you call yourself Muslim, then you are lying to yourself and de betraying yourself, deceiving yourself, and you will be regretting on the day of judgment. It will be too late for you to understand that. In salah, when going into sujood, should we go on knees? First or hands is to your convenience. Both are permissible. Is to your convenience. Uh, if you think that uh, landing knees will be more convenient for you to do that, and you don't look down upon other people, that's fine because it is done by Rasulullah. Either way, uh, most of the time he has done with the you know putting his hands first on the ground, or sometimes he has done. So it is based on whatever the situation is convenient for you in Salah because it is permissible either way, inshallah. So my brothers and sisters, mashallah, still we have got 15 minutes to go. Please forward this message to all your links. This is our question answer show, mashallah. And mashallah, many brothers and sisters have put these questions. And my brothers and sisters, don't think that I'm extreme in my answers. No, my brothers and sisters. I love you for the sake of Allah. And I love for you what I love for myself. So, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. You cannot be a true believer unless you love for others what you love for yourself. So, whenever I tell you the things which are straightforward, and alhamdulillah you know me that I don't support any particular sect or madhab. I directly tell you what is right and what is wrong and it is up to you if you want to take it. Okay. Can we pray one rakat with her? And what is the method of praying three with her? You can pray one rakat with her. You say Allahu Akbar. Then fold your hands. Then you read Thana. Then you read Surah Al-Fatiha. Then you read Surah Al-Ikhlas. Then you say Allahu Akbar. Then you go for the ruku. Then you get up from the ruku. Samir Allah Alimar Hamidah. Read Kunut. Do two sajdas. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Finish. This is one rakat with her. When you pray three rakat with her, then there are two ways to pray three rakat with her. One is you make the intention that you pray all three rakat together. First rakat normally, Allahu Akbar, folding hands, Sana, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah, any surah that you know it, Ruku, then get her from the Ruku, then two sajda, then get her for the second rakat, then again fold your hands, Surah Al-Fatiha, any surah, Ruku, then two sajdas. And then you don't sit for the second rakat. You get up, alhamdulillah, for the third rakat. Then you do your uh, Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah. And then go to Ruku. And then get up from the Ruku and read Kunut. And then do two sajdas. And then Tahiyat, Tashahud, and Durud. And then Dua and Salam. This is one way of praying three rakat. The other way of praying three rakat is Allahu Akbar. And you have the intention that you will pray two rakat. You will complete that. You give Salam. And then you will bring one more, the third rakat, not one rakat with her. It is third rakat of with her, but in a second, uh, you know, single rakat. So that will be your intention when you start with this with her. So you pray one rakat, Allahu Akbar, Durud, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah, Ruku, two sajda, get up for the second rakat, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah, then Ruku, then two sajda, then Salam, complete Salam, come out of the Salah. Then say Allahu Akbar with the intention of one rakat, which was the third rakat of the witr. And you do your thana, surah al-fatiha, surah, ruku, then get it from the ruku, qunut, and then do two sajdas, and then tahiyat, and tashawhud, and durud, and sadua, and salam. Alhamdulillah. These are the two ways of praying. Uh, one rakat witr and two rakat witr, three rakat witr, inshallah. So, my brothers and sisters, still we have got another uh, 10 minutes to go. And if you have got any, you know, questions, you can put the question in Urdu, English and uh, Arabic if you want. And you have the number given on the screen. It is uh, two, uh, you know, 275-0759322980. Uh, uh, internationally, it is 
double zero double four seven five nine three double two nine three eight zero and you can put your questions in Arabic, Urdu and English if you want inshallah and either you can call or you can text on the top chat and inshallah uh, also those brothers and sisters who are internationally you know watching this program they can follow underneath the description there's a time schedule given internationally that next Saturday again inshallah if Allah gives us tawfiq then I will come on uh, this show, live show, uh, 7 o'clock uh, of UK timing, inshallah. Barakallah fikum. Bismillah. So you can put these questions, alhamdulillah. As I was saying, my brothers and sisters, that please uh, subscribe to my channel and send the links and share the links with the people because I have got lots of, mashallah, uh, the, you know, teaching materials on YouTube where you can learn Quran in six days. You can learn Tajweed in say 11 lessons, mashallah, basic Tajweed rules of the Quran in 11 lessons. And also, mashallah, uh, you can learn uh, all the Arabic letters, 28 letters, Arabic alphabets with nine vowels with the pictures and if you learn those uh, 28 letters believe me you will be learning in, uh, with the, those 28 letters you will be learning at least 300 Arabic words with the pictures and with the translations. So that is the, the so far the series are uh, uploaded on the YouTube and also my 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi Rahmatullahi where so far I have uploaded 23 hadith and inshallah few more hadiths to go to complete the whole series of uh, 40 hadith of Imam al -Nawawi. and soon inshallah after this we're going to start the reminders of the um, month of Ramadan and also there will be some continuous series will be in Urdu for uh, from the book which is called Minhajul Muslim inshallah and also many more things are there uh, I'm also going to uh, start my Quranic Tafsir in English where I will be teaching uh, you know the meaning of the Quran uh, every Ruku that will be you know it will be based on Ruku by Ruku and every Ruku will be explained first it will be taught in Arabic then it will be uh, the translation then its purpose of revelation and then its merits and virtues and then finally uh, what benefits we get from this. Uh, is celebrating Shab-e Mehraj from the Deen? Please answer in Urdu. Uh, Shab-e Barat, uh, Shab-e Mehraj. So, there is no hadith. Ye sawal hai admi ka ke Shab-e Mehraj jo hai hum Islam mein jo hai log manate hain to kya ye Islam mein hai ke nahi hai? Pehli baat to ye samajh lein ke Shab-e Mehraj ki jo tarikh hai ye رجب کے اندر ہوئی ہے لیکن آپ اچھی طرح سے سمجھ جائیں کہ نبی پاک صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کے زمانے میں تاریخ کا سلسلہ نہیں ہوا کرتا تھا تاریخ کا سلسلہ نہیں ہوا کرتا تھا کہ تاریخ جو ہے اور کوئی بھی تاریخ اگر رکھی جاتی تھی یاد کی جاتی تھی تو وہ اہمیت اس کی رہتی تھی جیسے کہ چاند کا دیکھنا ہر مہینے کی ابتدا میں اور پھر اسی طرح حج کے موسم میں کیونکہ حج کیا جاتا ہے تو چاند دیکھا جاتا ہے محرم کے جو ہے ابتدائے سال کی جو ہے چاند کے حساب سے تو رجب کا رجب کے مہینے میں مہراج کا آنا یہ چاند کے حساب سے اگر آج اس سال مہراج یہ مہینے میں آئی ہے یہ تاریخ کو تو چاند کے حساب سے اگلے سال اس کی تاریخ بدل سکتی ہے وہ دن بدل سکتا ہے ایک تو یہ چیز ہے تو اس کی کوئی تعین تاریخ کا دن کا ہے نہیں دوسری بات یہ ہے کہ نبی پاک صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کو معراج جو ہوئی تھی وہ اسلام کے دسویں سال ہوئی تھی تو اس کے پہلے جو نو سال گزرے ہیں اس میں کوئی معراج کا ذکر نہیں ہے اس کے بعد نبی پاک صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اور تیرہ سال جو ہے تین سال مکے میں اور دس سال مدینہ میں رہے تیئیس سال میں نبی پاک صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی ذات اقدس سے یا صحابہ کرام کے ماشاءاللہ اتنے شوق و ذوق سے کسی نے بھی جو ہے یہ معراج کی تاریخ کو اس طرح کی عبادت کے طور پر یا برکت کے طور پر یا جشن کے طور پر یا جو ہے میلاد کے طور پر نہیں منایا 
موخان جو ہے کہہ رہے ہیں کوشچن آن اللہ ایٹریبیوٹ لائک فیس ہینڈس شین ہاؤ وی انڈرسٹینڈ دس سم از سیز ریئل سم سیز یا اوکے الحمد للہ دیر از ناٹ اے پرابلم یو ڈونٹ ہیو ٹو گو ان ٹو دیٹ بیکاز ایف یو سی دیٹ جنرلی پیپل دے سی اٹ از میٹر فور دے سی اٹ بٹ آئی سی نو اللہ ہیز گوٹ آئز اللہ ہیز گوٹ فیس اللہ ہیز گوٹ ہینڈس اللہ ہیز گوٹ لیگز اللہ ہیز گوٹ ماؤتھ اینڈ اللہ ہیز گوٹ ایئرز اینڈ اللہ کین اسپیک اللہ کین سی اللہ کین ٹاک اللہ کین واک اللہ کین سو آل دیز تھنگس آر بٹ ون وے وین وی سی دس وی ڈونٹ ہیو ٹو امیجن اللہ لائک او اوکے دس از یو نو ہر کل از ہی لکس لائک ہر کل از اور لائک دا گریک کانسیپٹ آف گاڈ ان دیٹ فارم اور لائک یس ٹو ڈے آئی واز سٹنگ وتھ مائی کرشچن فرینڈ ان جمعہ خطبہ آفٹر دا جمعہ خطبہ ہوئی واز ریڈنگ سم تھنگ فرام جینس اینڈ اٹ واز سینگ دیٹ گاڈ کیم ڈاؤن and he, he came in the form of human being, walked with them and dis- uh, put them into confusion because uh, they were, you know, following the religion and they were disputing. So God uh, has changed. So they were actually saying so many things about Allah and they were uh, considering Allah as a human being, as a human being. But this is, uh, this is not the uh, way we have to understand. Why? Because... Because these people, subhanallah, uh, they have that Allah created uh, the human in his image. Uh, so they believe that Allah will look like a human being. So this is, this is not necessary. We don't have to describe this because Allah will not ask us that, did you really inquire how do I look like? It is irrelevant because Allah has said that nobody can see him in this world. So we don't have to think of how the face was because once you think that this is how Allah's face is or then you don't understand though you make it metaphor, again you are wrong. You don't have to make metaphorically and description or you don't even have to say how Allah looks like this because Allah says that you can't say there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing like him. There is nothing like him. So you can't say that, you know, Uh, and you don't have to say it metaphor. Why you have to say that? Say everything, whatever we know from Allah, that Allah is there. Allah has got all these kind of descriptions of His, but it suits to His majesty. We don't have to describe because we don't have to, you know, know about it. And or uh, Shabe Barat Sahi hai Urdu mein please samjhaye. Okay, the first question was the brother was asking. Uh, in Urdu, uh, explain to us about the Mehraj. Is the Mehraj part of the deen? I explained to him in Ing- Urdu that Mehraj is not actually something that a Muslim should be worried about it. Number one, because we are uh, no, nearly end of the time now, but let me answer these two questions and then inshallah we'll conclude the show. First of all, I explained to him that when Rasul uh, introduced Islam, in the 10th year, the Mehraj took place. Mehraj is a traveling, uh, the whole journey, which is from Mecca to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to seven heavens. This is called Mehraj, journey of Mehraj. And uh, this actually, according to the scholars, it has happened in the month of Rajab. But we know that Rajab, any day of Rajab today will not be the same day in the next year of the Rajab because we see, we go by sighting of the moon. So there is no specific day for us to celebrate Mehraj uh, in the month of Rajab uh, also. Second thing I explained to him that Rasul lived in Medina, a Mecca, after the Mehraj. Uh, the, the Mehraj took place in the 10th year. Before that, the nine years, there is no concept of Mehraj known to anybody in Islam. Second thing, after Mehraj, he lived in Medina, Mecca for three more years. Nothing happened, no explanation, no Sahaba, no uh, uh, Imam have said that Rasul celebrated Mehraj this way or that way. And then when he migrated from Mecca to Medina after, you know, 13 years, 10, day, 10 years he lived in Medina. So 13, uh, nearly 23 uh, years of Mecca 
and 10 years of Medina, 13 years there is no concept of Miraj as specifically for Ibadah or marriage or virtues or all we have to do is we have to remember this story and learn the lesson of hardship that he has gone through it. Then the, now the brother has asked me this question about, a, he wants the answer in Urdu about Shabe Barat. Shabe Barat. Let me first answer the question in English, then inshallah I will answer the question in Urdu as well. Shab means it's a Persian word which means night. Barat means relieving people or releasing people from the prison or from the hellfire. So they are being saved and protected from the hellfire. So that is called Barat. So is it true or not? It is true that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees people every night, hadith in Tirmidhi, that every night Allah uh, descends to the first heaven and uh, removes the people's name from the hellfire. That means there will be some people who will be thrown into the hellfire and then Allah says that these are the people whom I will forgive them afterwards. So they will complete their terms and then they will be, so that happens every night. So that is called night of Barat, which means every night. But people, they refer to the 15th of Shaban. This is not from the hadith of Rasulullah Rasulullah did not name this Shabe Barat. This is a translation from Persian combination of two uh, words. One is Persian word and the one is Arabic word. Barat is Arabic word and Shab is Persian word. Their combination of that, the night where the people will be freed from the hellfire. So that is actually people are saying, but that is not 15th of Shaban. And inshallah, I will explain more inshallah if you have any question for in the next week. Let me explain this question in Urdu. Ye bhai sahab jo hai, Faiz bhai jo hai, ye pooch rahe ke shab e barat ki kya haqiqat hai. Pahle to ye samaj lehen ke shab farsi lafz hai, barat arbi lafz hai. Aur ye dono ko mila kar jo hai, ek jumla banta hai shab e barat. Aur to ye shab e barat Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ki zaban se to aya hi nahi hai. Ye humare aur aap jese logo ne isko naam diya hai. اب اس کا مطلب کے اعتبار سے ہم سمجھیں گے تو یہ وہ رات ہے جس رات میں اللہ تعالیٰ جو ہے بری کرتا ہے جہنمیوں سے جہنمیوں جہنم سے لوگوں کو جہنمیوں کو اور یہ صرف شب برات جو شابان کی پندرہ تاریخ کو کہتے ہیں ایسا کہیں نہیں ہے حدیث جو ترمیدی شریف کی ہے کہ اللہ سبحانہ تعالیٰ ہر رات کو سماعت دنیا پر پہلے آسمان پر نازل ہوتا ہے اور وہیں پر جو اللہ کے علم میں جو لوگ جہنم میں جائیں گے ان کی فہرست اللہ بنا کر کہتا ہے کہ یہ لوگوں کو میں جہنم سے نکالتا جاؤں گا یہ تو ہر رات ان کی فہرست بنتی ہے اور ہر رات ان کے نام لکھے جاتے ہیں اور وہ جو ہیں تو یہ ہر رات شب برات ہے ہمارے لیے لیکن خاص طور پر جو لوگ جو ہے شعبان کی رات کو جو ہے کہتے ہیں کہ پندرہ تاریخ کو اللہ جو ہے یہ مردوں کی عید ہے ان میں مردوں کو آزاد کرتا ہے جہنم سے اور گناہگاروں کو معاف کرتا ہے یہ ایسا کہیں پر بھی نہیں ہے کہ صرف شب برات کو ہی ہوتا ہے پندرمی رات کو شعبان کے یہ ہر رات کو ہوتا ہے تو اس طرح نہیں اور مزید انشاءاللہ آپ لوگوں کو کوئی مسئلہ مسائل ہوں گے تو میں اگلے سفتے جو ہے پھر آؤں گا آپ اس میں تفصیل سے مجھے اور پوچھ سکتے ہیں جو بھی آپ کے اشکال ہیں آپ دلیلیں بھی لاسکتے ہیں میں اس کا بھی جو ہے تفصیل بتا سکتا ہوں انشاءاللہ so my brothers and sisters الحمدللہ we have come to the end of this show and انشاءاللہ I pray for all of you who have contributed and who have contributed with the question answers and all those who have alhamdulillah forwarded this message to others and all those who have subscribed with me and all those who have shared this link may Allah give them the complete reward without reducing the reward of any other person Amin thumma Amin and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah accept this our gathering and make our way to the Jannah inshallah and also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give us sincere iman, sound health and everlasting halal wealth وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين